beauty, symmetry, magnificence are words which can best describe ancient Indian architecture. Dear friends, today I am going to talk about this very topic. In this lecture, first I am going to touch upon the evolution and then the various schools of ancient Indian architecture. Thereafter, I will discuss the various ancient architectural expressions under different rulers of ancient India and also their chief features. We will round up this session by discussing the international influence of ancient Indian architecture. Indian architecture encompasses a multitude of expressions over space and time, constantly absorbing new ideas. The result is an evolving range of architectural production that nonetheless retains a certain amount of continuity and its own individuality across history. Evolution of Indian architecture starts with the Indus Valley Civilization which dates between 2600 BC and 1900 BC or 2000 BC. Then the Maurya and the Gupta empires, the Buddhist architecture in the Ajanta and Ellora caves, the Sanchi stoop you must have all seen. Coming to southern India, we have the Hindu temples like the Hoysaleswara temple, Halabir, the Sun temple at Konark, Angkor Wat, Borobudur and other Buddhist and Hindu temples. And these, many of them were influenced by Southeast Asian architecture. With the advent of Islam, we have the Islamic influence in the Indian architecture like in Fatehpur Sikri, Taj Mahal, Gol Gumbas, Qutub Minar and so on. The British Indo-Saracenic style came with the British rulers and also European Gothic. Examples are the Victoria Memorial at Kolkata and the Victoria Terminus at Mumbai. Amongst the recent creations, you have the beautiful Lotus Temple, the Birla temples across the country and so on. Now we come to the various schools of art during the ancient period. Now this is a map and it shows the three most important schools of art. You can see the Gandhara school of art. Uh, Afghanistan and Punjab are its reason. The Mathura school of art, it flourished in and around the holy city of Mathura. And in the south, we have the Amravati school of art along the Krishna river. Coming to the Gandhara school of art, it flourished between 50 BC and 500 AD. As I told you, the region was Punjab to Afghanistan and it was an important center for Mahayana Buddhism up to the 5th century AD. It imbibed foreign influences like the Persian, Greek, Roman, Saka and Kushan. The Kushan king Kanishk gave the art greatest patronage. Now this school evolved beautiful images of Buddha in standing or seated positions, bodhisattvas in black stone, modeled on identical characters of Greco-Roman pantheon. Now Gandhara art has rich carving, elaborate ornamentation and complex symbolism. The best specimens are Jolia and Dharma Rajika Stup at Takshila and also from we get these specimens from Hadda near Jalalabad in modern Afghanistan. The tallest rock cut statue of Buddha is located rather I must say was located at Bamiya in modern Afghanistan. 
It dated between 3rd and the 4th century AD and was because it has been destroyed very sadly. It is a very sad case <clears throat> by the terrorists. The Mathura school of art flourished between the 1st and the 3rd century AD. As I had mentioned earlier, it flourished in and about the holy city of Mathura. It established the tradition of transforming Buddhist symbols into human form. Buddha's first image can be traced to the reign of Kanishk, that is about 78 AD. The earliest sculptures of Buddha were made keeping the Yaksh prototype in mind. They also produced beautiful images of the Jain Tirthankaras and gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. The Guptas adopted the Mathura school of art and further improvised it and perfected it. Now this is a picture of the Yaksh prototype of Buddha and this is at Dhali. Coming to the Amravati school of art, I must say that it flourished between 200 BC and 200 AD. This school of art developed at Amravati on the banks of the Krishna river in modern Andhra Pradesh. It is the site for the largest Buddhist stoop of South India. Its ruins are preserved in the London Museum. Now we come to the evolution of Indian architecture in its various phases in detail. So we take up first the Indus Valley Civilization. The Indus Civilization or the Harappan Civilization flourished during the Bronze Age that is 2500 BC to 2000 BC as I have told you. More than 100 sites belonging to this civilization have been identified. Prominent are Dholavira in Gujarat, Kali Bangan in Rajasthan, Lothal again in Gujarat and many more. Now what are the characteristics of this Indus Valley civilization? I must tell you that people of those era, of that era really knew how to build. Extensive town planning is the first characteristic and this is evident from the grid drawn pattern of the layout of the cities. Some even had fortifications, elaborate drainage and water management systems is the second characteristic of this civilization. And this is rare in contemporary civilizations at Mesopotamia and Egypt. It's only found in the Indus Valley civilization, the elaborate drainage and the water management system. The houses were built of baked bricks, of fixed sizes, as well as of stone and of wood. And can you believe this? Many houses at that time were also two-storied. The most impos uh, imposing of the buildings are the Great Bath of Mohanjodaro. It has galleries and rooms on all sides for changing and whatever purpose you may use them for. The second is the Granary Complex, comprising of blocks with an overall area of 55 into 43 meters. And I must tell you, that the granaries were intelligently constructed with strategic air ducts and platforms divided into units. Now this is a picture, you can see a Harappan street and adjoining houses. Now the left side has been excavated. You can see it very clearly, the planning of the city. The second picture is about this great bath of Mohanjodaro, the various rooms on 
either side of the bath. This is a drain of the same civilization, the Indus Valley. This is a well in a sarai at Harappa. You can see the bricks around the well. This is a Harappan latrine and it is almost resembling what we have in interiors of India today. This is a symmetry of the same era, a water tank. And this is the granary and a well too. And you can see the holes there. These are the air ducts which provided ventilation to the grain stored there. What ingenuity. Now we come to the modern period. You can see from the map that what a huge empire the Mauryans had. Only at the tip of India today is left out and Pakistan and all the area in the Bangladesh area and all else has been covered by the Mauryan Empire. Now about Mauryan architecture, I can tell you this is the finest specimen of Indian art. It was embalmed in timber. At that time, rocks and stones were not used. Chandragupta Maurya built many buildings, palaces, and monuments with wood and naturally most of them have perished with time because wood does not carry on like stone. The next emperor of the Mauryan dynasty was Ashok and he was the first Mauryan emperor who began to think in stone. Stonework of Ashokan period that is about 3rd century BC was highly diversified and comprised of lofty freestanding pillars, railings of the stupas, lion thrones and other colossal figures, huge. Some exotic forms show influence of Greek, Persian and Egyptian cultures. Now the time of Ashok was the beginning of the Buddhist school of architecture in India. It witnessed the construction of many rock cut caves, pillars, stupas and palaces. Cave shrines like Barabar, Nagarjuni Hills and Sita Marhi in Bihar are best examples. The Ashokan rock edict at Dholi near Bhubaneswar is the earliest rock cut sculpture in India. And you know, it has a sculpted elephant on top, signifying the emperor's conversion to Buddhism after his Kalang victory. You know that story, I think. The monolithic Ashokan pillars are a marvel. They are marvels of architecture and sculpture. The Sarnath pillar is one of the finest pieces of sculpture of this period. The Ashokan pillars also throw light on the contacts India had with Persia and other countries. Ashok constructed several stupas which were large halls capped with domes and bore symbols of Buddha. Important ones are at Bharhut, Bodhgaya, Sanchi, Amravati, Nag Arjun Konda and uh, so on. Now Buddhist shrines or the monasteries were built in irregular designs following the Gandhara school of architecture. Built on the patterns of a fort and defended by a stone wall, the monastery evolved from the site of an ancient stoop. The principal buildings were housed within a rectangular courtyard with a stoop in the south and the monastery in the north. Ashok had built many palaces but most of them had perished. But his palace near Patna was a real masterpiece. Now this is the Ashokan pillar which I was talking about. There is a lion on the top, free standing monolithic 
pillars majestic and marvelous as i told you that they were not standing alone they had the stupas or other buildings around them and this is this picture shows that this is the sachi stoop and uh, you can see the beautiful dome this is the sarnath stoop and this is the shanti stoop at thali now we come to the sungs kushans and the satavanas who came after the mauryans sungs and kushans came in the north and satavanas in the south they contributed in stone construction stone carving symbolism and beginning of temple or chaitya hall and the monastery or vihar what they did was that they enlarged ashokan stupas and replaced earlier brick and wood works with stone works sachi stoop was enlarged to twice its size in 150 bc the sungs also built the toranas or the gateways to the stoops this torna indicate the influence of hellenistic and other foreign schools in the sung architecture now this is the sachi stoop which we, which you saw earlier and this is the torna or the gateway to the stoop the satavanas constructed stupas at goli jagia feta bhatti prolu gantasala nagar anjun konda and amravati During the Kushan period, which flourished between first and the third century A.D., Buddh was represented in human form instead of symbols. Another feature of this period was that the emperor himself was shown as a divine person. The Kushans were pioneers of the Gandhara school of art, and a large number of monasteries, stupas, and statues. were constructed during the reign of kanishk uh, after this we'll come to the temples architecture largely in southern india i must tell you something about temple architecture first indian temple architecture is distinguished by two chief styles each having numerous sub styles first is the northern or indo aryan style now this is marked by a tower with a rounded top and a curvy linear outline the second is the southern or the dravidian style which has the tower usually in the shape of a rectangular truncated pyramid now the construction of the temples whether in the north or the south essentially followed a similar pattern now this is the layout plan of a typical temple you can see the steps which lead to the manda then you have the circumambulatory or the place you where you did the parikrama which you call parikrama and again a little one or two steps and you enter the garbh grah where the dt is launched lodged this is the external view of the temple that was that internal one this is the external one you can see the platform on which the temple has been erected and then the steps are there leading to the manda and then inside if you go will be the garbh grah which is of course you cannot see from outside and then the shikhar is there amalaka and on the top is the kalash the sanctuary or the viman with the upper and outer uh, pyramidal and tapering portion that is shikhar or pinnacle pinnacle now viman is a dark place housing the divine deity as i told you it is called the garb grah the entrance is through a doorway normally from the eastern side because east is always considered 
auspicious. The doorway is reached through a mandap or a pillared hall. Now earlier the temples may have had the mandap a little away from the main temple. This you can see in many temples and I can show you in this picture. See the mandap is a little bit away from the temple. This is the Periya temple and the mandap is away from the main temple. Later both buildings were united making way for a antaral or intermediate vestibule. A porch or ardh mandap led to a hall or a mandap and further into the maha mandap. Now this is a layout plan of a later temple. You can see there is no uh, mandap away from the mandir or the temple. The ardh mandap leading to the mandap or the prayer hall and inside is the garbhagraha and the circumambulatory around it and of course outside will be the uh, shikhar and the kamlaka and the kalash. A tower generally surmounted the shrine room while smaller towers rose from other parts of the building. The whole conception was set in a rectangular courtyard which sometimes contained lesser shrines and was often placed on a raised platform as I showed you in the picture. The perfect examples of temples on this structure are the Khajuraho temples. In some parts of India, the ascending pyramid roof format was not followed. The roof in such temples was still pyramidal but was formed of layers that gradually narrowed as they rose. The shikhar or tapering roof was specifically based on this design, which may have evolved from the domed huts of central and eastern India. <laughs> temples can be seen throughout the villages, towns and cities of India. A temple can be a simple structure by the side of the road or an entire complex of buildings. Regardless of its size, the Hindu temple is essentially a dwelling place for the gods. A principal deity resides at the temple like a king or queen in their palace. Other deities, attendants and mythical figures can also be seen as part of the temple structure. Others come and go in small groups through a hallway leading to an inner sanctuary. Here, the image or symbol of the main deity is located. In an active temple, statues of the deities are covered with garlands and draped with rich fabrics. Above the sanctuary rises a central tower, often brightly painted. The shape of the tower resembles the mythical mountain home of the gods. Other features of temples include sacred bathing ponds, walled enclosures, and gateways in a variety of shapes and sizes. Here, at Madurai in southern India, the gateways tower above the temple complex and are covered with statues. Some temples are no longer in active use. At Khajuraho in central India, tourists now flock to see celebrated images of gods and loving couples adorning the exterior walls. In Konarak, near the eastern coast, are the remains of one of the largest temples ever built in India. Mm -hmm. 
It was dedicated to the sun god Surya. The original tower no longer survives. And we can only imagine its size from the smaller buildings that still stand. After this, we come to the uh, Gupta Empire, talking about temples. We will first discuss the Gupta Empire. Now this is the map, you can see the Gupta Empire colored in the light blue and the dark blue are the tributary states and this is about 480. Gupta period ranged from 4th to the 7th century AD. This was called the golden age of art and architecture in India. Sarnath emerged as a school par excellence in Buddhist art. Best sculptures from Sarnath depicts Buddha giving his first sermon in the deer park. This period also witnessed a tremendous resurgence of Hinduism. Images of Vishnu, Shiv, Krishna, Surya and Durga were built during this period. The Udaygiri caves in Madhya Pradesh house a colossal image of Lord Vishnu. The basic elements of Indian temple consisting of a square sanctum and a pillared porch emerged at this time. Temple sculptures were not necessarily religious. Many drew on secular subject matters and decorative motifs. The Parvati temple at Nachana, the temple of Bhitargao, the Vishnu temple at Tigawa, the Shiv temple at Bhumra, and thus Avtar temple at Deogar are among the best examples of the Gupta style of temple architecture. The cave architecture also attained a great degree of refinement during the Gupta period. The Chaitya and Vihar caves at Ajanta and Ellora, cave, Ellora are the best specimens of cave architecture of this period. The rock cut caves at Khandagiri, Udaygiri and Undavali also belong to this period. I will show you the pictures of some of these places that I have mentioned. This is the Das Avtar temple at Deogar. You can see the beautiful sculptures. The lady is waiting on the Lord. These are the Ajanta and the Ellora caves. The beautiful frescoes inside should be seen by each and every person. Now this is the inside of the Ellora cave temple. These are the Udaygiri caves. And now we come to the Palas. The Pala school of architecture flourished in Bengal and Bihar during the 8th to 13th century AD. And this was under the Pala and the Sena rulers. Nalanda was its most active center whose influence spread to Nepal, Myanmar, and even up to Indonesia. Stone sculptures of this period are found at Nalanda, Rajgrihe, Bodhgaya and other places. I will show you the pictures. This is the Nalanda University. It was very very famous at that time. These are the Nalanda ruins and Bodhgaya I had talked about. This is the giant Buddha at Bodhgaya. The picture is a little smudged. After this, the Pala and the Sena rulers come the, we'll talk about Chandelas, the 10th and 11th century AD. The Chandelas of Jijihoti or Bundelkhand built temples at Khajuraho, famous for their graceful contours and erotic sculptures. There were originally 85 temples, 
now only 22 remain they were built these temples were built within a very short period say about 100 years each temple is a typical example of a hindu temple it is divided into three main compartments as i told you the cella or the garbhagriha an assembly hall or mandap and an entrance portico or the ardh mandap some temples also contain the antaral or vestibule kendriya mahadev temple is the largest and the most beautiful of the khajuraho temples shiv temple vishwanath and vishnu temple chaturbhanj are important temples of khajuraho this is a slide of the khajuraho temple sculpture now we come to the gujarat part the gujarat part of india and there you know that the solanki is ruled so we have the solanki st style of architecture now this architecture consisted of a sanctum the temple consisted of a sanctum a closed hall and a porch that are interconnected internally and externally the wall faces are broken by numerous indentations projected and recessed alternately which are continued along the elevation producing a very pleasing contrast of light and shade in larger temples a detached peristyle or hall is added in the same axis often preceded by a torana that is the gateway in rare cases the hall has more stories than one usually they have only one story now examples of solanki style of architecture the temple at sunak that is 10th century sun temple at mudhera 11th century the vimala temple at mount abu that is again 11th century and the very famous somna temple at kathiawar the 12th century which was ravaged by mahmud ghazni many times and you all know about it this is the beautiful somnath temple at kathiawar it is situated near the sea the sea is rough and it is a pleasure to visit this temple coming to the chalukyan architecture the chalukyas ruled between 450 to 650 ad they constructed several stone built shrines and temples at i hole which are mostly hindu but a few are jain i hole was the town of temples consisting of nearly 70 buildings the chalukyan architecture is a juxtaposition of indo aryan and dravidian styles in the temple architecture and it is also refer, uh, referred to sometimes as the visara style of architecture this is a narsimha at i hole you can see the tall sculpture there it is evident that during the chalukyan period the rock cut method was slowly superseded by the use of stone masonry the chalukyas also constructed four rock colored pillar halls at badami in the latter half of the 6th century ad three of which are brahmanical and one is jain the final phase of the chalukyan art is represented by the temples of pattadakal that is 7th century ad this is the rock colored pillar hall at badami you can see the shiv installed at the end of it this is malik arjun and kashi vishwanath temples at pattadakal and you can see the beauty and the magnificence of these structures talking about the orissan architecture the temples at orissa the ancient kaling 
are the finest examples of Indo-Aryan style of temple architecture. The generic name of Orissa temples is Dune which has in its front a square building or assembly hall called Jagmohan which corresponds to the mandap. Later other structures like Nat Mandir or Dancing Hall and Bhog Mandir or Hall of Offerings were added to the temple structure. The lower and upright portion of the dune is called the Bada. The tall middle portion is called the Chapra. The flat fluted disc at the summit is called the Amla and finally there is the Kalash. I had shown these parts in the earlier picture. The Orison temples as a whole are of the a styler order, pillars being notable by their absence. Orison temples can be divided into three groups. The early period that is 750 to 900 AD like uh, you have this uh, temple of Parshura, uh, Parshurameshwar and Lakshmaneshwara at Bhubaneshwar. Then the middle period comes that is 900 to 1180. In this you can include the Mukteshwara and Lingra's temple at Bhubaneshwar and the very famous Jagannath temple of Puri. The later period was between 1100 to 1250 AD and its examples are Rajarani temple at Bhubaneswar and the Sun temple of Konark. This is of the first period. This is the Parsurameshwara temple at Bhubaneswar. This is belongs to the second period. The Jagannath temple is uh, of Puri, the famous temple all over the world and this is the Rajarani temple which uh, comes in the third period which I have discussed with you. Mm, now I am showing you a beautiful picture and this is of the sun temple at Konark. It, the whole temple is in the form of a chariot, a sun chariot and it is a marvel of astronomy. This is the sun chariot I was talking about. It is another uh, angle of the same temple of Konark. Now let us discuss something about Jain architecture. Every phase of Indian art is represented by a Jain version. I may tell you that the Jain architecture has no style of its own. It is an offshoot of Hindu and Buddhist styles. Initially, Jain temples were carved out of rock faces and the use of bricks was negligible. Later, Jains started building temple cities on hills on the concept of mountains of immortality. The Jain temples were surrounded by embattled walls, were divided into wards, guarded by massive bastions at its ends with fortified gateways at the main entrance. No specific plan was followed. They were results of sporadic constructions. Only variations in these temples was in the form of frequent chomuks or four face temples and these the image of Tirthankara faces the four sides. For example, the Chaumuk temple at Adinath which was built in about 1618-1880. The most spectacular Jain temples are found at Ranakpur and Mount Abu in Rajasthan. I will show you the picture of them. Karnataka, Maharashtra, UP also have important Jain temples and I may tell you the carvings, the sculpture of Jain temples is just 
beautiful. Here is the picture of the Jain temple at Ranakpur. The inside, the pillars, you see the beautiful carving. Impressive, absolutely. This is the Palitana temple. And this is the Dilwara temple, the Jain temple. Just look at the beauty of the inside pillars, the scarving and the oh, absolutely awesome. No, This is another <coughs> angle of the same temple. Now we come to the Rajput architecture. We have we discussed something about Rajput architecture too. And you all must be knowing that the finest examples of Rajput architecture are their forts and palaces. Palaces were inner citadels surrounded by cities, enclosed by a fortified wall. This you can see in Chittorgarh and Jaisalmer palaces. Some forts were protected by wide moats like in Bharatpur and Deeg. Now the largest palace in Gwalior, this is the Man Mandir, it was built by Raja Man Singh Tomar, who ruled between 1486 to 1516 AD. This palace overhangs a stone cliff, which is punctuated by five massive round towers, crowned by domed cupolas, linked by delicately carved parapets. It's a beauty to behold them. And the whole facade is enriched by brilliant blue tiles. Now see, this is the Chittorgarh Fort and this is the Victory Tower at Chittorgarh Fort. This is the Jaisalmer Fort. You can see the bastions uh, guarding the fort. This is another angle of it. This is the Deeg Fort which is surrounded by a wide moat to protect it and this is the Bharatpur Fort. Both are protected by wide moats. This is the beautiful, beautiful Man Mandir Palace at Gwalior. Now the palaces of Jaisalmer, Bikaner, Jodhpur, Udaipur and Kota built predominantly in the 17th and the 18th centuries represent the maturity of Rajput style. By that time the Rajput style had matured. Fortified city of Jaisalmer in the Thar Desert is constructed by local yellow brown stone and when the sun sets the whole city turns golden. That is why it is known as the golden city and it is a real delight to behold it at that now the city of Bikaner is enriched by a 5.63 kilometers of long stone wall in rich pink sandstone. In Jodhpur, the Jodhpur fort dominates the city which is surrounded by a 9.5 kilometer long wall with 101 bastions guarding the city. This is the Jodhpur fort. You can see it is built on a hill. This is the uh, first is the inside view. You can see the beauty, the magnificence of it. And this is the outside view. The pink city of Jaipur was built by a Rajput king known as Raja Jaisingh in 1727 AD and it represents the final phase of Rajput architecture. There is fusion of eastern and western ideas in town planning. By that time, the Europeans had started coming into India. The palace is at the center of the city, which has always been the case. And it is the synthesis of Rajput and Mughal architectural styles. Other famous buildings of Jaipur are the very famous Hava Mahal and the Jantar Mantar. It still tells the time, which were built by Jaising II. And uh, like the Konark temple, this is also, the Jantar Mantar is also an astronomical delight. This is the beautiful Hava Mahal at Jaipur. And this is the lake palace at Udaipur. 
um, so much about North India. Now a little about the South India, Southern India, the architecture there. The South Indian style of temple architecture is very distinct from that of the rest of India. Four types of architecture correspond to the four kingdoms of Southern India, the Pallavas, Cholas, Pandyas and the Vijayanagar rulers. According to the plan, four-sided, polygonal or curvilinear uh, temples. The southern Vimanas are classified in the southern Shilp and Agam texts as Nagara, Dravida and Visara. This is the a beautiful Angkor Wat temple of South India. First we come to the Pallavas. They rule between 600 to 900 AD. The temple architecture of Pallavas is divided into two groups. The rock cut that is between 610 to 690 AD and structural that is 690 to 900 AD. And the greatest Pallava architecture are the rock cut temples at Mahabalipura. The Kalashnath and Vani Kuntha Perumal temples at Kanchipuram are the best specimens of the structural temples of Pallavas. Transition of wood to stone. I told you before that it was effected in northern India during the reign of Ashok in the 3rd century BC. But in southern India it took a lot of time. It took almost 1000 years more. And it was under the Pallavas that this transition was effected. This is an example of the Pallavan architecture. This is a short temple at Mahabalipuram. This is another Pallava creation. The rock cut caves at Mahabalipuram. They are beautiful inside. This is of course an external view. And see the rock cut sculptures at Mahabalipuram. See the sculpture, beautiful. The next uh, dynasty were the Cholas who ruled between 900 to 1150 AD in southern India and their art is a continuation of that of Pallava times. Earlier Chola temples were modest in size, they were not very huge. Later ones had Vimanas or Gopuras dominating the landscape. Chola architecture achieved its peak at Thanjavur, the capital established by the Chola ruler Raja Raja I. The Brihadeshwara temple at Thanjavur erected around 1000 AD has been described as the most beautiful specimen of Tamil architecture. You have to see it to believe it. Temples at Thanjavur, Chidambaram, Shirirangam, Gangai Konda, Cholapuram, Darasuram, Tribhuvanam amply illustrate the style of architecture in southern India during the Chola rule between 11th and 13th century AD. And Chola style had a great influence on the architecture of Hindu temples of Ceylon that is Sri Lanka, Southeast Asian kingdoms like Sri Vijaya that is Sumatra and Chavakam that is Java. This is Chola architecture. On your left side is Thanjavur. This another one is from Thiru. This is the beautiful Chola sculpture. Now coming to another southern kingdom that is the Pandya kingdom which flourished during 1100 AD and 1350 AD. This is the map of the Pandya territory. A part of Ceylon is also included in their kingdom. You can see from the map. Now Pandyas built many gopurams or monumental entrances to the existing temples. The Sundra Pandya Gopuram added to the temple of Jambukeswara 
around 1250 AD and Gopigram of Kumbakoman that is 1350 AD are the best examples. Pandyas are also credited with the construction of Arya Vatsevara temple and Darsunan temple in Tanjore district during the first half of the 14th century AD. Now the Hoyslas. The Hoysla temples have complicated plans. They may be polygonal, they may be star shaped, angled projections. The carved surface are executed with remarkable precision and usually in chloride. Columns are multifaceted. Each temple is supported by a low pyramidal tower which is often surmounted by a vase shaped ornament. On many occasions such pyramidal towers are used giving a look of a double or a triple temple. Hosla period temples are to be found at Belur, Halavid and Sri Negri in Karnataka. Channa Keshwa temple at Belur, Hoseleswara at Halbid are the most famous ones. This is the Hosla architecture. This is the Belur uh, temple of Halibid. And uh, you can see the beauty in these architectures. Of course, you have to go to literally see them. These are just pictures and very few at that. Now, the Vijayanagar architecture. The Vijayanagar kingdom flourished between 1336 AD to 1565 AD. And Vijayanagar style inherited aspects of three main regional styles of the art of South India, Dravidian, Cholas, Cholas and Pandyas and the style of Chalukya Hoysal tradition. It also took something from the Indo-Islamic art of the Bijapur region. Vijayanagar temple architecture has special features. The development of the temple complex has concentric series of rectangular enclosure walls with gopuras in the middle of each side. Secondly, the construction of many mandapas, Kalyan mandap being the most conspicuous amongst them. Then the temples also had a Devi shrine to keep the replicas of consort of the deity. And another uh, feature is the absence of mortar in their construction. You can see in this map the Vijayanagar Empire and a specimen of the outer, uh, the external view of a temple. The Vijayanagar tradition shows a distinct scheme of decoration in terms of architectural space. Decorative friezes horizontally on the plinth molding, caves and pillars of the temples, interiors and vertically on composite pillars, plasters of the walls and doorways of the gopuras as well as in the inner part can be seen. Pillars in the mandapas have figural motifs in low relief but this uh, distinct scheme of decoration is very much visible in the Vijayanagar tradition. Now, Vijayanagar city, you know, it had so many temples that it was called Kovilapura. Of the numerous Vijayanagar complexes, the most significant are those at Kanchipuram and Thiruvannamalai and Velur. This period also witnessed the construction of several secular structures like the Lotus Mahal and elephant stables which show strong Islamic influence.
talking about the Nayaka period of 16th century AD. I must tell you that the Dravidian style of architecture assumed its final form under the Nayakas and this has lasted almost until the modern times. Tirumalai Nayak was the greatest of the Nayaka rulers. He ruled between 1623 to 1659 AD. The style developed by these rulers is described as the Madura style and it is most evident in the Minakshi temple, the famous Minakshi temple at Madurai. This was built in 17th century AD. Now this is a double temple having two separate sanctuaries. One dedicated to Sundareshwara <coughs> that is Shiv and the other to Minakshi or Parvati. It has the tallest Gopuram or the temple tower in the world. This is the picture of the Minakshi temple. You can see the Gopuram, the tallest in the world. Now I'll tell you about the influence of ancient Indian architecture. The traditional system of Vastu Shastra serves as India's version of Feng Shui influencing town planning, architecture and ergomanics. Now though Vastu is conceptually similar to Feng Shui in that it also tries to harmonize the flow of energy which is also called life force or pran in Sanskrit, qi in Chinese and ki in Japanese through, through the house, it differs in the details such as the exact directions in which various objects, room materials are to be placed. The Indian architecture, the ancient Indian architecture has influenced Eastern and Southeastern Asia due to the spread of Buddhism. A number of Indian architectural features such as the temple mound or temple spire or shikhar, temple tower and temple gate have become famous symbols of Asian culture used extensively in East Asia and Southeast Asia. The central spire is uh, also called a uh, pagoda and the southern temple gate is noted for its intricacy and majesty and uh, the Gopurams can be seen and also the Toranas. So I have taken you on a long journey right from 2500 BC to about 17th century AD and I hope you enjoyed. Of course it is just a drop of a big ocean which I have shown you. I will just show you a clipping to round up my lecture. Thank you.